Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken. We're back in Chapter 4, Designing Studies. In Section 1, we looked at observational studies, sampling, both good methods and bad methods. And in Section 4.2, we're looking at the other way that we generate data, which is experiments. We have quite a few objectives, and I'm going to recommend that you pause the video, read through the objectives, and when you're ready to move forward, turn the video back on. The main difference between an observational study, what we learned about in section one, and an experiment, what we are learning about in section two, is the fact that we impose a treatment in an experiment. So in an observational study, there may be some interaction, but there's no specific treatment or change that is imposed on the study subjects. But in an experiment, we do impose intentionally impose a treatment so that we can measure the response variable. We want to be able to establish cause and effect sometimes and not just observe an association. So when we want to do that, we have to run a controlled experiment so that we can determine, kind of hold all things equal, only change the one element, which is the treatment, and then measure the changes in the response variable. We're able to compare the response variable in the control group and in the treatment group so that we can determine what the effect was of the explanatory variable. Sometimes confounding can occur between our explanatory variable and other variables. And what that means is we cannot distinguish the effect of our, our explanatory variable from the effect of some other variables that have an impact on our response variable. And when that happens, again, we call that confounding. And it's the reason that we really want to run controlled experiments so that when we have a treatment group and we have a control group, they are as similar as possible. And the only difference between the two is the treatment. And then once we've isolated all other factors except the treatment, we can establish that causation relationship. So the experimental units are the subjects or the individuals on which you are experimenting. The treatment is what you are creating, what change you are creating in those experimental units. And you want to be able to observe the response in a response variable. That's what you're going to be comparing in terms of some type of measurement. There's an example in your textbook about an SAT course. In the experiment, a high school offered an SAT prep class to a group of students, and they were given a pretest. They had the SAT online prep class, and then which is the treatment, and then they had the SAT test. So the response was measured, and from the pretest to the post-test, the, the actual SAT test, the students gained 45 points on their score. Now, while this might seem that the SAT prep class helped them gain those 45 points, we didn't have a control group. And what that means is we don't know whether the experience of taking the pretest just alone help them earn more points on the SAT, or if the work that they were doing in their regular math classes helped them to earn more points on the SAT, or if it was in fact the treatment, the SAT prep class that they took, if that allowed them to gain more points, or some other factor that we haven't even talked about. So what that means is this experiment wasn't really designed in such a way that we would be able to isolate what the effect of the treatment was on that SAT score. In order for us to be able to run an experiment so that we can answer our research question, we have to design experiments well. And there are several different elements that we want to include in well-designed experiments. One of them is comparison. And that means that we want to be able to compare a treatment group with a control group to make sure that the effect of the treatment can be isolated in the response variable. So in order to make sure that, that we can compare fairly, 
we need to have random assignment of our experimental units to different either the treatment group or to the control group. And this random assignment has to occur using a chance process. We talked a lot about that in the sampling section and that can mean flipping a coin, it can mean using the random integer function on your calculator, it can mean using a random digit table. There are a lot of different ways that we can do it, but random assignment is key into assigning our subjects to either the treatment or the control groups. Several elements of or principles of experimental design and comparison, of course, is the one that we already talked about just a few minutes ago. We want to be able to compare the two groups, uh, one that received the active treatment, one perhaps that is the control group that received the inactive treatment, or we might have two active treatments. But anyhow, it compares two or more situations. We want random assignment. We want our subjects or our experimental units to be randomly assigned to the different groups. We'd like them to be as similar as possible so that there are no other factors that are affecting the response variable. We want to control all other variables so that we can isolate the effect of the explanatory variable. And replication isn't exactly what it sounds like, but we want to have a large enough group in our treatment and or our treatment groups and or our control groups so that we can really make sure that no individual differences that occur by chance are having an impact on the response variable. In a completely randomized design, the treatments are assigned to all the experimental units completely by chance. And that means ideally our treatment groups and our control group would have roughly the same number of experimental units. It doesn't have to be exactly the same number, but it's better if we have approximately the same number because it allows us a better basis for comparison. And so a design would look like we take our experimental units, we randomly assign them to treatment groups or treatment and control groups, we apply the treatments, and then we are able to compare the results. What can go wrong? The logic of a randomized comparative treatment depends on our ability to treat all the subjects the same way in every way except for the actual treatments being compared. This is holding all things equal except for the treatment. And that brings us to some of the other elements that we want to include and account for. When we have an active treatment and an inactive treatment, so for example, um, a medicine that actually has an active ingredient in it and another medicine that doesn't have the active ingredient but has a similar appearance, taste, smell to the active medicine, sometimes the patients who have the inactive medication still get better. We call that the placebo effect. So the placebo is an inactive treatment, but the placebo effect is that the power of suggestion, people feel like they're supposed to be getting better, so they actually do get better even though they, they are on the inactive medicine. So that is something that when we have our control group, we can account for because we can measure the effect of the difference between the groups and not just the overall uh, measurement of the response variable. We also have something that we call blinding. And in a blinded single blind experiment, we know that the patient doesn't know what treatment they got, whether it was the active or the inactive treatment. But in double blinding, the researcher also does not know. Whoever is applying the treatment also does not know which subject got the active treatment and which got the inactive treatment. And that allows, again, the power of suggestion to not have an impact on whether a patient has a response to the explanatory variable. Anytime we run an experiment, we want to see what the effect is. What is the result? What, are, what does the comparison tell us about the differences in the treatment? And we're always looking to see, are the results statistically significant? Statistically significant means 
that it's an effect, an observed effect so large that it would rarely occur by chance alone. It is unlikely to happen by chance. It is more likely that it's the result of whatever our experiment was, whatever the treatment was. So that's statistically significant. This is an idea that we're going to carry with us throughout the rest of the year. So it's important to having, start having a good understanding of that definition now. There's another experimental design that we use sometimes, and that's called block randomized design. And we, we do blocking. And what that means is we separate our volunteers or our subjects, our experimental units, we separate them into different groups that share a common characteristic. And it must be a characteristic that is meaningful to the experiment. So we split them up to start with, then we randomly assign them to our different treatment groups and run parallel experiments for these two blocks. When completed, we compare within the block the different results on our, result, uh, our response variable, and then we combine the results. We don't compare the two blocks to each other, but we do combine so that we know how each of those different blocks responded to the treatment. This is often done in medicine, well, in a lot of different areas, honestly. And the, the way that you can think of this is if there's a characteristic that's meaningful, for example, if we are testing out a new athletic shoe, we may want to split or block on whether someone is actually an athlete. So if somebody is a casual wearer of an athletic shoe, they're going to have a completely different wear pattern than someone who is an athlete and is using it for athletic activities. So we may block on whether someone is an athlete or not so that when we do the comparison of how the shoe responded or whatever treatment we did to the shoe, it's not because someone was an athlete or not an athlete, it was because of the treatment that was made to the shoe. So here are a couple more definitions associated with blocking. Just a reminder, blocking is what we do in experiments and stratifying is a similar idea what we do with sampling. There's another design that we use. It's called match pair design and this is where we want to create blocks by having almost exactly the same groups or the same groups that undergo the treatment in turn. And let me give you an example of that. One example might be if we have students who we want to test how they perform with caffeine and without caffeine on a performance activity. So one day we will give them a caffeine drink, but we won't let them know whether it is caffeinated or not caffeinated. They just know that they're getting a drink. And then we take their performance, measure their performance. On another day, we give them the opposite. We give them the caffeinated drink. And again, they don't know whether it's caffeinated or not caffeinated. And again, we measure their responses. So each of those experimental units, each of those different test subjects is their own control group because we give them the treatment, the active treatment and the inactive treatment just on different days. So this is what we call a match pair design. Another example of a match pair design is if you can imagine we take a pair of boots and we put weathering on a, some kind of chemical on the left boot, but not on, or on one of the boots, we flip a coin and put it on one of the boots. We don't know which boot and then people go out in the world and they use both of the boots and then they come back after a month and we're able to compare what the weathering was on the two boots. That's another example of match pair design. Okay, we hit a lot of objectives in this section. Don't forget you still need to read your textbook. It's got tons of information. Do all your practice problems so that you can get the practice, especially designing those experiments and making sure you know all of those definitions. See you back in class.